executive director of the Conservancy, and I am just absolutely thrilled to welcome you to the latest program in the series that we operate in collaboration with our partners at Rock Creek Park of the National Park Service, Race, History, and Rock Creek. Um, the history of our national parks, especially our beloved Rock Creek, encompasses people of all races and walks of life. Rock Creek Park and Rock Creek Conservancy have partnered to tell these stories at the intersection of race, history, and Rock Creek, covering a wide variety of topics, people, and historical events in Northwestern DC. Um, I invite you to the Conservancy's website to see past programs and for resources that can help you better continue discussion of the topics that are sparked by this evening's programs. Um, this evening's program is a wonderful partnership with our fellow park partner, Washington Parks and People. Um, as I've said, Rock Creek Park, as well as some of our community members. Um, throughout the evening, you'll hear from a very fantastic panel of those people who will be introduced shortly. We're quite honored to be joined, and I believe she'll be joining us just as soon as she's able by council member Brianne Nadu, who's been a longtime friend of Rock Creek, as well as a really passionate defender of water quality for us all. Um, after the panel discussion, we'll take questions from all of you. Please put your questions in the chat box and we will aggregate them for the panel when they are done. I'm sure based on the discussions we've had with our panelists ahead of time that there will be many. This is a rich and really, uh, I think, vibrant discussion for you all. Um, one final reminder to please stay on mute if that is difficult for anyone. My colleagues Elena Lindstrom and I will help you with that. Um, I wanna thank Elena and Lindstrom for all of the work that they've done to help get us ready for this program, as well as our partners at Rock Creek Park, who are too numerous to name, but I will just call out specifically Brad, Rita, and Dana, who I think are with us this evening. Um, as well as I'd like to thank, I see several of our board members here at the Conservancy, as well as board members of some of the other park partners who are part of this work tonight. And with all of that, I am so very pleased to introduce my colleague and collaborator, Julia Washburn, the superintendent of Rock Creek Park. Julia is truly what we at the Conservancy think of as a Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion warrior, um, though I mean warrior in the friendliest of possible terms. And we're so grateful to have her experience and expertise as manager of the very special places that comprise Rock Creek Park, including Meridian Hill. So Julia, with that, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Um, before we begin, uh, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge that we are meeting virtually today on the ancestral lands of indigenous tribes. These tribes are represented today by the peoples of the Piscataway, Pamunkey, Delaware, Catawba, Eastern Shawnee, and other tribes that uh, call the Potomac and the Anacostia watersheds their home. We recognize and honor their continued connection to this land and their stewardship of its many resources. Um, I wanna start out by thanking the Rock Creek Conservancy, Jeannie Bra and Elena and Lindstrom and your whole team, Jeannie, um, and also Washington Parks and People, uh, Steve Coleman and, and Jeff and your whole team. Uh, for co-sponsoring tonight's event. We're really excited about tonight's event and really happy uh, to have both organizations as co-sponsors. Um, it will be an honor when she gets here um, to have Council Member Nadeau uh, with us tonight. I'm sure she's just delayed by all of the you know, normal events of the everyday work day for a city council member, which are many and complicated. Um, but I do hope that she can join us and uh, we'll be very excited to have her when she can. Um, I also want to uh, uh, recognize and thank our other speakers, um, including Elise Elder Norquist, who's the author of the special resource study, African American History and Experiences of Meridian Hill Malcolm X Park. Um, I also want to welcome Bernal Irby, from Hello. the Alliance to Preserve the Civil War Defenses of Washington, and also his mother, Carol Miller, who is a, a native Washingtonian and a retired kindergarten teacher with great affinity for Reading Hill Malcolm X Park. So thank you both for being with us this, this evening. And uh, I wanna acknowledge Steve is also a panel member tonight. So happy to have you on the panel too, Steve, in addition to um, 
co-sponsoring. So Steve Coleman, the executive director of Washington and actually founder of Washington Parks and People. Um, so, and of course, I want to thank uh, Rock Creek Parks Cultural Resources. Um, well, first of all, I want to stop and say I want to thank all the members of the Rock Creek Park team who have worked on this and the other sessions involved in the Rock uh, uh, Race History and Rock Creek series, which we are really excited about and plan to continue ad infinitum. Um, but it does take a team. I want to thank all of uh, our team members that have been involved. Um, and then I want to thank uh, Rock Creek Park's cultural resources management specialist and archaeologist, Brad Kruger, who's going to moderate today's panel. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Brad. Okay, thank you so much, Julia. And uh, thank you to Jeannie, to Steve, and to all of our panelists today. Um, my name is Brad Kruger, and I am the uh, the cultural resource program manager for Rock Creek Park. Um, I also serve as the park's archaeologist. Um, so there is a lot of history in the park. Um, and not surprisingly, there's a lot of history at Meridian Hill Park. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. We're going to be kind of delving into the history of Meridian Hill. Um, it's a very popular park. Um, if you have not been there, I would encourage you to go. Um, it's situated kind of between the border of uh, Columbia Heights and the Adams Morgan neighborhoods uh, between 16th and 15th Street Northwest. Um, people go there every single day for, for recreation, for rest, for relaxation, for taking in just the amazing views of the city. And not surprisingly, it has an incredibly rich and detailed history. Um, it's actually the history of Meridian Hill as a park goes back over 100 years. And as we'll learn a little bit later on, um, the history goes even further than that. So we're going to be talking about the history of the park. Um, for the National Park Service, our mission is to help preserve uh, America's special places for the continued enjoyment um, for future generations. And that's exactly what we're doing with Meridian Hill Park on a daily basis. Uh, since 2001, um, the National Park Service uh, actually that year published a cultural landscape report that detailed the history of the park itself as a designed space. And that report provided recommendations for how to preserve and maintain uh, the significant park features. So since that time, since 2001, the National Park Service has really made a concerted effort to try to preserve and maintain all elements of the park. So if you visit there today, you will actually notice that there are some sections of the park that are closed off. And uh, currently, uh, restoration work is being done in the lower plaza. Um, and that work is taking place. Uh, currently, the crews are on hold um, uh, for the winter. Uh, we had quite the storm uh, last week. So uh, everything is on, on hold for the winter, but it will resume in the spring. Um, I'm excited to announce that part of that restoration and rehabilitation effort we'll see the reconstruction of the Edith Noyes armillary sphere uh, that was once uh, a prominent feature on the lower plaza in the Exedra area. So um, we're really looking forward to that and being able to reopen that lower plaza to the public and reintroduce a, a long missing feature from the park. So I mentioned that the history of Meridian Hill goes back well over 100 years. Uh, it was actually authorized to become a park um, by Congress in 1910. And then a few years later, in 1912, uh, landscape architects were brought on to the design team, uh, most notably, um, uh, excuse me, um, let me get my notes here, because I do not want to misspeak. All right, here we go, thank you. Um, so most notably, the landscape architects were uh, George Burnap and then Horace Peasley. And between those two individuals, they really helped 
um, create and shape um, Meridian Hill Park um, with the extensive uh, collaboration with the Commission of Fine Arts. So the history of the park as a built space, as a design space, um, you know, was captured in that cultural landscape report. But what wasn't so much captured in that document um, was the social history. And the park has been utilized by scores of people throughout the decades. And we wanted to get a better understanding of the, the people that were using the park, the people that called the area home, um, you know, the notable happenings that occurred. And as we were looking at the park in this context, um, we recognized that there was a real need to explore this history a little bit more in depth. So uh, a few years ago, the National Park Service decided to undertake a special resources study. And that study is specifically looking at African-American experiences in Meridian Hill Park since the Civil War uh, to the present. So the idea is that uh, this study was aiming to, to look at the social history, to look at the park as a place of, of activity, uh, at, a place of protest, a place of demonstration, and chronicle all of that history into one document. So I am happy to report that that document is available online to the public. Um, hopefully throughout the talk, we can share that link with you all. So if you're interested in taking a very deep and detailed dive into history, um, you can check that report out at your leisure. Uh, so what we're gonna do today, we have some amazing panelists with us. Um, Julia was kind enough to already give you an introduction, but I will um, also provide just a little bit more information on each of our speakers. Uh, so we're gonna actually start off our discussion with uh, Mr. Burnell Irby. Hello. And he's going to be sharing with us some uh, family photographs of the park. So Mr. Irby, um, as we heard, he is a native Washingtonian uh, and he grew up just a short distance away from Rock Creek Park. Uh, he is a secondary social studies teacher and a football coach. And he is also a board member of the Alliance to Preserve the Civil War Defenses of Washington. And as we heard, Burnell is joined today uh, by his mother, Carol Miller. Carol is also a native Washingtonian growing up in the U Street neighborhood. Uh, Carol is a retired elementary school teacher and spends her time conducting family research. So I would like to start um, with both Burnell and Carol. And, uh, you know, invite you to share some of your history and uh, share some of these great photos of the park with us today. Well, thank you. Uh, most of the photos were taken either by my grandmother or my grandfather. Uh, when my grandmother was growing up, they lived, uh, the next door neighbor was the photographer Addison Scurlock. And she, my grandmother, Louise, Miller, that's her married name, uh, they went to Dunbar High School together. So that's where she, so I don't know if that was part of her affinity for taking photographs or not, but we, we have a, a trove of them. All right, this is my grandfather, Carol's mother, Carol's father. Mother, do you have anything to, to add to this? So this is at Meridian Hill Park. So the photographer probably is my grandmother right now, Louise Miller. My mother would take your picture and then give you the camera so you could take her picture. So most of the scenes we have, you will see my mother and my father in the picture. For many years, we thought it was my father who was the photographer. And then after we started looking and realized who her neighbors were, we finally figured out that it was actually her. So this is, I think this is from about 1935. 
Uh, the picture on the left is a, I guess it's a friend of the family's name, John. I don't know what his last name is. And this is my grandmother on the right. That is not daddy. <laughs> yeah, we joked that this was before she got married. So this is again at Meridian Hill Park down at the fountain. So at the time, she may have been living on T Street, but once they, she, my grandparents got married, they moved to Ontario Road, which was behind the, uh, the castle that was across the street from Meridian Hill Park. So then here is my grandfather. So it was common for them to uh, get dressed up and go, go to different places in the city. This is about 1938, I think. This is from Rock Creek Park. Yeah, when they first married, my parents went to live with my father's family at 23rd and N Street. So the pictures that you see of Rock Creek Park are probably their excursions into the area just around the P Street area. So this is one of the scenes that they took. That's my father. These pictures are very clear because my brother had the negatives and he sent me the negatives about two months ago and I was able to print new copies. So that's why they look as though they were taken yesterday. This is 1938. The picture on the left is Meridian Hill Park and the one on the right is my mother in Rock Creek Park. I don't think she was too happy with his uh, focus. This is Meridian Hill Park again. This is the Titanic Memorial and they live near its original location. So they were able to take this picture before it was moved. This is a view of 16th Street. And you see the castle, outline of the castle. On the right. Daddy on the left and my mother in Rock Creek Park. With the castle behind him. Yeah. Oh. Uh, we're back at Meridian Hill Park. This is my grandmother who lived at 12th and T, 1204 T Street. That's my older brother and the little person with the doll is me. I think I'm about 18 months old. If you enlarge the picture, if you can, and you look over my grandmother's shoulder on the right side, are you able to enlarge? Is that the steer you were talking about? Yes, I can't remember the name, but there it is. And I understand it's missing. Yes, that is correct. That is the Edith Noyes Memorial Armillary Sphere. Yes. And it's been gone from the park for quite some time. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, we're very excited as part of the current rehabilitation project that memorial, that sphere will be reconstructed and reinstalled in the park. So this is, I mean, truly a phenomenal photo. <laughs> well, there I am at the age of 18 months and there's that sphere and it was there. And this, I was 
telling Elena that this photo has other significance too. My uncle became the subject of a lawsuit by which deaf black children were educated in Washington, DC. And it became part of the prehistory of Brown versus the Board of Education. And this is just about the time they were discovering that he was deaf, which is something that wouldn't happen nowadays, but he was about three, I guess. But there we are, quite a few people on Sunday afternoon. That's the end of the slideshow. Right. Well, you know, Burnell and Carol, thank you so much for sharing these photos with us um, and sharing your memories with us as well. Um, I, I wanted to lead off our discussion with this slideshow um, to highlight the, the social component and that social history of the park. Um, most often when we talk about places and parks and sites, you know, we talk about the, the built things, the, the physical and tangible objects of a place. And that's very much what the cultural landscape report that I spoke of does. It, it looks at the, the statuary and it looks at the memorials and the fountains and the pools. Um, but a park isn't nothing if, if, if people don't utilize it. Um, and these photos show that, you know, over the years, your family did just that. You enjoyed the park, you, you, you know, have memories there. So that, that's truly incredible. So thank you so much for, for sharing um, these memories with us. So, you know, we hope that you'll stay on at, with us for the rest of the discussion tonight um, as we go through more of the history and the special resource study that was done on the park. So again, to both Burnell and Carol, thank you so very much. We do appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having us. All right, so as I mentioned, um, you know, the, the study that was undertaken, the special resource study, uh, really aimed to look at the African-American experiences in the park um, from the Civil War onward. Um, the park itself is historically significant. Um, it was first listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1974, and then it was designated as a National Historic Landmark by President Clinton in 1994. So there is a lot of significance related to the, the built environments, the, the exposed aggregate concrete um, uh, walls and steps and fountains. Um, all of those elements uh, make the park what it is. But as I mentioned, it really is the people and it's the park serving as a place for um, togetherness and protesting and demonstrations. Um, and it was, it's that aspect of the park that we really wanted to highlight with this study. Um, so at this time, I would like to introduce um, the author of the special resources study, uh, Elise Elder Norquist. Um, and Elise, uh, she is a, uh, has contracted with the Organization of American Historians um, to complete similar studies for the National Park Service. Uh, she has public works, uh, published works for the NPS that include um, the special resource study that we'll hear today, um, an administrative history for Catoctin Mountain Park, the Henry Farm Cultural Landscape Inventory for Manassas Battlefield Park, and the Georgetown Area Cultural, or excuse me, Georgetown Area Chesapeake and Ohio Canal Cultural Landscape Inventory, among others. Um, and she recently began working as a historian in the private sector. So Elise, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, it was the, the special resource study that you put together was an incredible body of work. Um, there was a lot of information that you, you combed through to help put together uh, this history and help fill in our gaps um, in our understanding of how this place of Meridian Hill Park has been used and has evolved over time. Um, you know, we, the, the park's official name is 
Meridian Hill Park. We know a lot of people know it today as Malcolm X Park. So, you know, we wanted to explore that history a bit more fully. And this study does exactly that. So um, it's my understanding that you put together slides. So would you like to present on those or? Sure, that works. Um, okay. One of the questions that you had had was, um, what did the Meridian Hill area look like during the mid 19th century? So that's something I'd be happy to touch upon first. Great. All right, so I'll just jump right on in. So the land that eventually became Meridian Hill Park was located outside of the original limits of the city. It was located in Washington County. Washington County was rural. It was covered in large land holdings or um, plantations, which were worked by enslaved laborers, as well as tenant farms and small freeholds. By the beginning of the early 19th century, uh, wealthy Washington Tonians were beginning to construct what were called gentleman farms or just large estates on the outskirts of the city in Washington County. And one of these estates was Commodore Porter's Meridian Hill Estate. So if you were wondering where Meridian Hill came from, that name was because 16th Street at the time was Meridian Avenue. And it was thought that Meridian Avenue was the prime meridian of the city of Washington. It was also planned to become the prime meridian of the United States. So numerous other people owned this land where Meridian Hill Park is, um, and numerous other people occupied it, one of which was John Quincy Adams and his family after a failed re-election bid. There was also Colonel Gilbert L. Thompson, and he owned the land in the 1860s. He's actually noted as the property owner on this 1860s map here and he is known to have had enslaved laborers working the land. What is interesting was just before the Civil War, the land that is now Meridian Hill Park was operated as a pleasure park, which was just a place for people to go and picnic, drink, and dance. So you can go to the next slide if you'd like. One thing I did want to point out is that similar to the city of Washington, um, in Washington County, the enslaved African American population was declining leading up to Civil War, the Civil War. So in 1860, there are about 5,200 residents in Washington County and 800 were enslaved. Uh, next slide, if you can, please. Are we there? So a little bit of background here too. Um, during the Civil War, many enslaved African Americans from the South fled north in search of freedom and safety. At first, the Union did not have a set policy for how to deal with these runaways, so they were either sent back south to their plantation owners or put to work for the, the Union. By 1861, August 1861, the Confiscation Act had been passed, and this act classified um, African Americans from the South as contraband. It freed them and it sent them to live in government organized housing in the city. Some of this housing was located on Capitol Hill and that was called Duff Screens Row. But by 1863, there were about 10,000 refugees in the city. They were all clustered living in pretty much the same area and the conditions were unsanitary. And eventually there was an outbreak of smallpox at Duff Screens Row. This resulted in moving the refugees to other locations in the city and in Washington County. So if you go to the next slide, it shows that there were, the top two were locations within the city. The bottom were located within Washington County. And specifically, the last one was located on Meridian Hill, but not the location of today's Meridian Hill Park. What was located on Meridian Hill Park is the next slide. Get there. And that was Camp Cameron. So it was common for um, newly freed African Americans to find food, safety, refuge, and work at Civil War encampments, including Camp Cameron, 
which was located on the land that had previously been owned by Commodore Porter. And his estate was actually used as a hospital throughout the Civil War. All right, next slide, please. Okay. So let's see here. I'm sorry, I got a little lost in my notes. <laughs> So after the Civil War, African-American communities developed around these Civil War camps and hospitals, and I circled them here on the map for you all. Uh, one of the largest African-American communities that developed after the war was in the Shaw slash Greater U Street area. And part of the attraction to this area was the um, establishment of Howard University. And as with other areas in the city of Washington at the, at the time, um, the land was being subdivided to accommodate the post-war population. It wasn't necessarily segregated, it was self-imposed segregation. Um, and there were definitely distinct clusters by race in the various neighborhoods of the district. And if you can go to the next slide, please. So on Meridian Hill, a subdivision was established in 1860. It was called the Halls and Elvin subdivision. What is interesting is that the African American community that had developed near Camp Cameron after the Civil War was included in the layout. And that community was located in the northeast section of today's Meridian Hill Park. We know from various sources that these individuals lived in frame dwellings and worked a variety of jobs, including laborer, um, cook, and so on and so forth. There were also, it wasn't exclusively, exclusively an African American neighborhood. There were also some white residences, but those were located more along Florida Avenue on the east side of 15th Street. And there were also some pockets west of 16th Street. And next slide, please. I think this is a good part to stop for me if there's if that works for you, unless you want me to continue going through the whole thing. Yeah, why don't you go through your slides and then we can follow up with uh, with questions. I think that's good. Okay, so similar to other subdivisions in the area, development was slow um, on Meridian Hill, but it really began to pick up in the 1890s. And this was facilitated by the paving of um, 16th Street, Meridian Avenue, north of Florida Avenue, which was then Boundary Street, because remember it marked Washington County from the city of Washington. Um, it continued to develop, and by the 1880s, there were a significant number of homes. There was a school for African Americans at 16th Street and Columbia Avenue. And again, this um, development was primarily concentrated on today's Meridian Hill Park. And I just wanted to note that one of the attractions to the neighborhood too was the establishment of Wayland Cemetery in 1873 to 1874. It was located, um, I think it was to the east of the park at 15th and Euclid Streets and was established as a um, place where African-Americans could train to become preachers or teachers. So next slide, please. So Mary Foote Henderson comes up uh, in all this history a lot, um, and she played a major role in the development of the park. So Mary Foote Henderson was the wife of a former Missouri senator, and she and her husband began purchasing lots in the Halls and Elvin subdivision in 1887. She purchased six adjacent lots on the west side of 16th Street, so right next to the park, and on the southernmost spot, she built her home, which was known as Henderson Castle. And we actually got to see um, some pictures of that earlier, which was pretty cool. Um, Mary Foote Henderson was a socialite. She was ingrained in Washington's political and elite society. And she was very passionate about the beautification of the Capitol. So one of her visions for 16th Street was developing it into a ceremonial gateway to the Capitol. So as part of her efforts, she actually engaged an architect to design a presidential mansion on Meridian Hill. 
Um, and this is a picture or a drawing of that here. It did not, um, it was rejected by Congress, but she definitely made a name for herself um, by introducing lobbying and advocating for a presidential mansion on Meridian Hill. Her efforts didn't stop there. You can go to the next slide, please. And she began advocating for the development of 16th Street as President's Avenue. And as part of this, she lobbied Congress for the placement of a memorial, a memorial to President Lincoln on Meridian Hill. Again, she hired several architects to design um, you know, what it would look like and where it would be located. And it would have been located on today's Meridian Hill Park where that African-American community was um, currently existing. Um, that plan also fell through. So she came up with another one and she decided that she was gonna develop 16th Street as a sort of embassy row. So what she did was over a period of time, she bought a bunch of land and she hired someone to construct a total of 13 private residences. And these residences were geared toward foreign embassies as well as white elite individuals. And you can see some of those to the left of 16th Street in this picture. And then you can see the land of today's Meridian Hill Park. You can't see, however, the homes um, that were existing there at the time. <clears throat> uh, next page, please. So Mary Foot Henderson had also heard of plans for a proposed park on Meridian Hill. This was proposed in the 1901 Macmillan Plan, which reinstated the 19 or 1791 Montfont Plan and it extended the classical Mall Vista, it extended the plan beyond the original city limits into Washington County, and of course suggested a series of parks and parkways, one of which was on Meridian Hill. And you can see that location for Meridian Hill on this map here. It's kind of in a circle, the shape of a circle. Um, but that plan was, they didn't follow through with it. And so Mer uh, Mary Foote Henderson began to advocate for the placement of um, that park on Meridian Hill. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So clearly the African American community on Meridian Hill did not fit her vision and I just wanted to note at this time, and I marked in red all of the homes that were either owned or occupied by African Americans. Some of the, the majority of the homes were owned by um, white, um, white homeowners, though some were owned by African Americans. And based on the sentence, census records, we know that they worked a variety of skilled and unskilled jobs, including cook, dressmaker, laundress, servant, school teacher, and day laborer. All right, next slide, please. And these are actually some pictures of the homes that existed on Meridian Hill. <clears throat> Sorry, next slide, please. So Mary Foote Henderson really began her lobbying, lobbying efforts. And in 1908, a bill was introduced to acquire the land through purchase or condemn, condemnation. It was passed, however, no action was taken. It was really the Commission of Fine Arts, which was created by Congress in 1910, that moved forward the park proposal. And one of their, one of the first things they did was approve um, the development of, of a park on Meridian Hill. At the time, management and the development of the park was not under the National Park Service. It was under the Office of Public Buildings and Grounds, or PBG which was under the Chief of Engineers of the United States Army. So the Office of PB&G actually oversaw all federally owned parks in the district. All right, next slide, please. So the federal government set about acquiring the land and giving the homeowners on Meridian Hill appraisals for their property. I think there's actually a typo in this here but two of the nine African-American homeowners on Meridian Hill accept the, accepted the appraisal amount that was presented to them. The remaining African-American homeowners and some of the white home, homeowners with African-American renters 
fought against the condemnation. Some of these residents stayed into their home, stayed in their home until about November 1912. And until that point, they were actually paying rent to the chief of engineer's office until they were evicted. Unfortunately, I was not able to find much information about the impact, <coughs> excuse me, of these families relocating. There was more talk about the great park that was going to be constructed rather than the impact that it had on this community that was existing there. There was one oral history that recounts that this community on Meridian Hill was very close knit and they tried to relocate to an area where they could be close together. And some of these areas where they might have moved was the western area of the Halls and Elvins subdivision. So that was to the west of 16th Street. Um, there are also several apartment buildings available to African Americans along 17th Street and north of Calorama Road. And these are actually some pictures of the various areas of the park being uh, constructed. So we can, we can move forward. So the office of PB&G, which was later renamed with an even more difficult name to pronounce, oversaw all federally owned parks in the district, including Meridian Hill Park. Segregation was enforced through administrative design and de facto segregation though de facto segregation prevailed at most district parks. I was not able to find evidence though that Meridian Hill Park was segregated by administrative design. And there were actually a ton of letters that I came across um, that either were white park users complaining about African-American park use or calling for the exclusion of African-Americans from the park altogether. I would have loved to find information on the African American perspective, but unfortunately that was, you know, their, that side of the story was not really presented. Um, but there was one oral history where someone recounts that um, the African American community, various members would like to come up to the park during a hot summer's night and, you know, get some cool air and kind of rest and sleep at Meridian Hill Park. Um, next slide, please. So in 1933, that was when the National Park Service began to take over management of Meridian Hill Park. Uh, the National Park Service was very clear about its policies and it made it clear in letters um, that they received that the park was not segregated. They said the facilities of the National Capital Parks are available to all citizens and cannot be denied to members of a particular race. And next slide, please. So numerous non-segregated events were held in Meridian Hill Park. One of these events was the Starlight Chamber Music Series. It was held in the park during World War II. Uh, you can see here down by the reflecting pool. And this was a series that ran during the summers of 1941, 1942, and 1943. Numerous other types of events were held in the park. Um, there was another concert series, and if you go to the next slide, there was a theater. And this theater was created in 1949 when the National Theater chose to close its doors rather than integrate. So both white and African American members of the community joined together and raised about $18,000 to construct the stage and for initial expenses, and the theater series was a huge success. Um, I think that from, from what I recall only continued for one summer, but it was great. Uh, apparently a really, really great time. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this, I don't know if you want to wait for this, Brad. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, we can pause there for, for now. Um, but I, I think what you have certainly shown us is that um, there was an African American connection to the Meridian Hill area um, well before the park was established. And all of that history um, and all that information that you just shared is in the special resources study. Um, so again, for those that may be joining a little bit late, um, that report, that study is available online and available to the public. So we will share that link with you 
um, if you would like to download it and um, you know have a look for yourself, take that deep dive into history. Uh, so now we're going to uh, pivot a little bit and we're going to introduce our next panelist. Um, and this is, I'd like to introduce uh, Council Member Brianne Nadeau. And is the council member with us? Hey, Brad. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so to introduce you, uh, uh, council member Nadeau was elected to the council of the District of Columbia in 2014. In her many years of service to the community, she has brought perspectives from a career that has spanned the non uh, nonprofit, public, and private sectors. Uh, Bran is a community activist at heart and engages Ward 1 residences and businesses through civic organizations, volunteer opportunities in neighborhoods and schools, and through regular dialogue uh, as part of her Bran on Your Block and Community Conversation series. So council member, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure to be here, thank you. All right, so we've heard a little bit about um, the early history of Meridian Hill Park um, and how it was primarily an African-American neighborhood, um, at least to the east of 16th Street. Um, would you be willing to speak to what the community looks like today? Sure, and I'm also going to take a few liberties in talking about my personal history with the park because this has been such a beautiful discussion. Um, I loved seeing all of those photos. Thank you so much for sharing them. That just, it's a beautiful history and a beautiful personal history. Um, I was doing an interview a few years ago and someone asked me to pick a place to do a photo shoot, a place that was meaningful to me in Ward 1. Um, with my daughter, because we were talking about being a mother as a council member. Um, and I picked uh, Meridian Hill Park um, because um, it's a place that's always been special to me um, in my time in the neighborhood and the community. But I actually had gone back and looked at some old photos of mine from my first visit ever to the District of Columbia when I was in high school. And I had actually posed for a photo right at the bottom of the cascading fountain, just like. Um, the photo of um, of of Miss Miller's mother, um, and it was I was I was kind of blown away. I had forgotten um, that I had come here on a field trip to to learn about activism and protests, and that one of our stops had been the park. Um, and then I got the opportunity years later to represent the park as an ANC, even before my time as a council member. Um, and uh, I, I love being on a panel with Steve Coleman, who who taught me so much about the history when I was coming in. The neighborhood has changed a great deal um, since some of those photos and, and that history, of course. And, you know, um, one of the things that is always important to me as a council member, especially as a white woman representing such a diverse community, is that we talk about and share our history so that folks who arrive here for, um, you know, who, who um, are embarking on their great love story with the District of Columbia are aware um, of what came before them and how th their presence can change the dynamic, but also how their presence can honor that history and those memories as well. Um, so if you, if you, so I lived at the bottom of the park for when I first moved to the area um, in the, the ugly old Johnson era building that um, blocked the view from the park, uh, was the first thing that blocked the view from the park. Um, and, uh, so I really felt like it was, it was sort of my backyard, um, and always loved it. Um, years later, my daughters go there, um, with their daycare to run around during the day and burn their energy. So it really does come full circle. Um, the neighborhood now you have sort of some, some wealthy homeowners all living around the perimeter of the park, but you also have affordable apartments. Um, and if you go further east um, beyond 15th Street, you certainly have one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the entire District of Columbia. Um, but it's to say that it's diverse means that it's gotten whiter, right? Because it used to be less diverse than it was um, more people of color. Um, so certainly we've seen a great deal of 
gentrification. Um, that word to me can sometimes be loaded and everybody sort of has a different definition for it. You've seen a lot of change. You've seen some displacement, um, but you've also seen opportunity. I mean, we certainly have homeowners that have been there a very long time um, and um, have been able to share in the change and the growth. But if you go to the park any early morning um, or weekend day, you'll really see a snapshot of folks and, and users, um, everyone from folks who are walking, you know, walking around, doing their laps, um, people exercising on the green, people walking their dogs, um, people playing with their children, um, and just people enjoying um, the people watching on those beautiful historic benches. Um, I can say as the representative of the park and the DC government um, that whenever part of the park is not accessible, I hear about it. People love their park. Um, the lower level being under construction. Um, I did have, I had someone ask me, you know, let's pause it during the pandemic because um, people are using that space and it's really important and we shouldn't be doing construction. And I said, look, my history here with this park is that when we have the federal money, we spend the federal money, <laughs> right? So, um, but the, um, you know, just whenever the grass is being reseeded, you can tell people really feel like this is our space. You know, we don't want it to be unavailable to us. Um, so please, like, hurry it up, whatever it is you're doing that's limiting our use. Um, so it has changed. The neighborhood's changed a great deal over time. Um, but one thing that hasn't changed is how important the park is to the community. Wonderful. Yeah, and you, you mentioning that you have taken photographs of yourself at the bottom of the Cascades. Um, that is such an iconic view within the park. Um, almost anyone that goes there when the fountains are running, you know, captures that same view. And what's really cool to see in, is that the, you know, the photos that we saw earlier today um, that Burnell and Carol shared with us, um, it's the same view. The fountains look almost essentially identical as they do today, as they did, you know, back in the 30s and the 40s. So, you know, and that's part of the restoration effort. You know, the unfortunately time marches on and it marches all over the park, right? So the, the features where um, they need to be um, repaired, um, but we're able to, you know, utilize, um, utilize funding to make those repairs and, you know, preserve the same features for the enjoyment of all generations, especially the future ones. So uh, thank you so much, council member. Um, right now, I would like to introduce our, our next panelist, uh, Mr. Steve Coleman, and bring him into the discussion. Um, so a little bit about Steve. Um, Steve has led uh, the nonprofit Washington Parks and Peoples award-winning Alliance of Community-Based Greening Partnerships since it began as a volunteer neighborhood park crime patrol in 1990. In three decades of nonprofit service, Steve has been a vice president and director of research for a national organization, a program director for an international environmental advocacy network, staff officer for a national foundation, a fundraising consultant for environmental media initiatives, a community organizer, and an intern reporter for public broadcasting's McNeil Layer Report. Uh, born in India, Steve has lived in DC's diverse Reed Cook neighborhood for 36 years. So Steve, welcome so much to the panel. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Brad. It's really an honor to be here with such a great panel and gathering. And I just want to thank Mr. Irby and Ms. Miller again for those amazing photos. And Brianne, uh, this has been quite a journey, hasn't it? Um, and uh, Ms. Elder, thank you for all of your hard work on this. Um, it is a complex story and it's one that I'm so happy that we're taking the time to dive into tonight. Um, this, this, I hope, will be the beginning of um, a lot more collaboration in, in exploring this story. Um, I want to note that we didn't mention the Nakotch Tank tribe earlier. Uh, they're all gone. Um, 
but we are very much on their land. I'm literally sitting on the top of Meridian Hill. Our center is built on top of that sacred place. Um, when Josephine Butler, my late um, boss and mentor, who was the real founder of, of uh, Friends of Meridian Hill and Parks and People, uh, when she met the Native Americans who walked across the continent on the 500th anniversary of Columbus's landing to mourn what had happened to it in those 500 years, those tribes chose to end their walk from Panama City and San Francisco, not at the White House or the Ellipse or the Mall, but here on the top of Meridian Hill, because this is seen as a sacred place. And if you stand on the top of 16th and Euclid, where, uh, where we were seeing that um, image of the Lincoln Memorial or the Presidential Palace being up there. Today, you can look down that axis and see the artificial meridian running through the White House and the Jefferson Memorial Dome, but beyond it, you can see the natural meridian of the Potomac River, and you can watch it all the way to where it turns in the bend in the river where the uh, elders of the Piscataway tribe are buried in Piscataway Park. Um, and so it truly is sacred land. And it's interesting to think about the sweep of history of this hilltop and all the ways that people are coming together with each other and with the land in ways that they kind of always have. They come here to learn, they come here to mourn, they come here to play, they come here to graze, uh, no longer livestock, uh, now it's, it's their dogs. Um, they come here to pray, they come here to sing, um, and this is what we see to this day. Um, my own experience with the park was typical of a lot of people coming to DC. I've actually been here now almost 40 years. I came here to save the planet. I wasn't really interested in DC at all. Um, I just, but I did want to live near the park because I was kind of intrigued by both it and Rock Creek. And so I've lived on Euclid Street since 1984 at the top of the park. Um, and I was shaken out of my, um, you know, lack of involvement in the local neighborhood. Um, 32 years ago, this coming Saturday on Dr. King's birthday, when a neighborhood boy who had grown up on my block after his family of Ontario Road, after his family had come here from Jamaica for a better life, was playing at the same hour that Dr. King had been born. And Ricky Magnus was gunned down and fell in the tree box next to my home. And my housemate, who was an emergency physician, ran out to try to save Ricky's life. And Ricky died in her arms. And the police came out and put out yellow tape and told us to go inside. They said that we needed to put up more locks and lights and don't go out at night and don't talk to strangers. And whatever we do, don't go in Meridian Hill, Malcolm X Park, because that was seen as the center of all violence and all crime and everything that was bad in the neighborhood. And our neighborhood decided not to do what the police asked. Somebody mentioned a group of African-American grandparents who had started a crime patrol, not as vigilantes, not with weaponry, but with love, with the requirement that they say hello to everybody. And they had found extraordinary power in neighborhoods like Bloomingdale and Eckington and Edgewood and Barrowon over in Ward 8 in lifting up the community that they knew was always DC's greatest strength. And that beginning, um, carried us into the park. The first time I'd never been in the park at night until nine days after Ricky died. And we were wearing these silly fluorescent orange hats with the name of our neighborhood on them, trying to look cool with some sort of hippie, like streetwise hip uh, street lettering on the hats because we wanted kids to look up to us. They didn't look up to us. They called us pumpkin heads because we looked ridiculous. But as we came into the park, even amid the broken glass and the graffiti and in the trash, there was something serene about it. We didn't know it was this Native American sacred ground. We didn't know about the Civil War and the, and the African American Theological Seminary and the Columbian College, but there was something about it that pulled us in. And it was this requirement that we had to say hello that changed my life. Because as we walked up to the Overlook, we realized we actually weren't alone. In that dark night, on that cold winter, night of January 24th, 1990, when the murder capital of the country was DC and the murder center was right behind this park on University Place in 8990. We met Reverend Morris Samuel and Howard Coleman. Reverend Samuel was the mayor of the park, an ordained Baptist minister. 
Um, and uh, he knew everything about the park. He'd come when the ducks had tried to nest and seen people dying of AIDS coming to park for solace in their final days. And Howard Coleman had been homeless and an addict and a dealer, couldn't read or write, but when Howard talked about the park, he had tears in his eyes. Howard ultimately would risk his life to solve the last murder that ever happened in the park. Um, and Morris um, would inspire generations of people since, and they're both gone, but we carry their spirits with, with us. I'm not the founder of um, Parks and People. It really is these folks. And another amazing woman, Josephine Butler, who was the daughter of enslaved, or daughter of sharecroppers and the granddaughter of enslaved people, a hero of inner city DC for generations, active in uh, as a laundress, as a teenager, informing America's first ever union of black women laundry workers. This was a woman who saw the deep abiding power of land and community of the earth being the place that brings us together. As Maya Angelou's beautiful poem on the pulse of morning calls to us. Um, and it really was the stories of these folks, the dreams of the kids and the memories of these elders that inspired the community to come together and do something that the government had really struggled to do. Um, the park was really falling apart. There were people in the Office of Management and Budget who were saying this park will have to be torn down, it's useless. Um, and people in the neighborhood knew better that it had people who cared, who believed in it. And, um, and so Josephine um, actually ended up um, leading um, storytelling in the park and music and teaching. And um, we planted flowers with homeless kids who had never seen earthworms in the soil. Um, and uh, she told them about the power of earthworms to do good, to make life happen. Um, and she led a march for parks as part of the advocacy for the park, invited friends of parks from all over the US to come to this hilltop on the 25th anniversary of Earth Day. And this is her hat um, with some of her causes. She was a co-founder of the statehood movement for DC. Uh, and this is the um, button that she wore to speak to 250,000 people down on the National Mall uh, with the, all the friends of parks groups that had marched down 16th Street from Meridian Hill, Malcolm X. Um, it's an amazing story. There's so many heroes. Bob Stanton, the first uh, African-American National Park Service director. Um, Ed Dutch, who grew up at 13th and W getting in trouble in the park and ultimately would volunteer at the end of his tour of duty to come back year after year, day in and day out as not the cop or the ranger for the park, but really the grandfather who led all of us. Um, Francisco Rigores, who co-founded the, the uh, drum circle, that's probably one of the largest and most long-standing drum circles on the East Coast of the United States. Every Sunday, the weather is fair. Doc Powell, Brother Ah, who brought his world music youth ensemble in. Georgette Powell with her bringing of art in the park every year. And so many people through the years. Um, we found over and over the deep power of these memories and dreams that has kind of taught us a lot. Um, through our work, through the inspiration we got from these folks, we brought music back to the park. Um, these guys would tell us about summer in the parks when the National Park Service had done amazing things in the wake of the horror of Dr. King's assassination to use the parks in, in especially Meridian Hill, Malcolm X um, in DC, but also in New York to lift up hope, to lift up art, to lift up heart at a time when Many people were, weren't sure if there was any left in our country. Um, and um, those things really inspired people. And, and when Morris and Howard told us about standing in the park before 20,000 people uh, with Pearl Bailey singing a month after Dr. King was shot, uh, it moved us. And so we, would, we brought the music back and we brought the kids back. We convinced one daycare center after another, <laughs> Brienne, uh, we convinced Martha's Table first to come in, and then we got schools to come in and nonprofits and businesses and, and realized there was just such power here in all these people coming together. Ultimately, thousands and thousands of volunteers helping to plant trees. There were trees that had been cut down because the assumption was that they would, uh, even though they were part of the historic landscape, they would make it dangerous. But actually cutting the trees down and making the lights brighter had created a prison yard effect that removed some of the romance and the allure of the hilltop. 
And so it was the inspiration of these memories. And yes, um, the park had been a place of real division. Um, you were speaking, um, Ms. Elder, about the uh, residences on 17th Street. That building in the middle of that block of 17th was labeled as, quote, colored housing on the official zoning plots of the District of Columbia into the 1980s. And one of the residents there who was a lifer in the neighborhood told me about, um, and he actually had worked for the Park Service many years earlier in the White House, but he told me when there were hot summer nights, uh, once it got dark and he felt like it was safe for him to come to the park and not be, and not feel unwelcome as he often felt as a black man in the park by day. Um, they would string hammocks between the trees because the park uh, always had a great breeze. There are other parts of the park that are difficult that we have to really look at. We have to dive in deeper in the administrative history of how the park came to be. Uh, Dr. Elder referred to the, some of the segregation aspects. Well, we have actually uh, records uh, in, in the National Archives of um, the U.S. Fine Arts Commission members uh, specifically saying, for example, um, that lighting in the fountains would be inappropriate because it would, quote, attract too many of the colored element to the park. So it wasn't just a de facto thing, it was intentional. And there was a record of not just benign neglect, but uh, abject uh, division and discrimination uh, for generations on top of all the discrimination that we know that people face um, in, uh, you know, in, in black and white matters in this country. And so the park is really kind of a microcosm of our country and our world. It's a place where we have a chance to come together and see, are there ways that we can unite, uh, that we can gather across all that divides us, all the fears and all the horrors and all that's wrong in our world. And during this time in the pandemic, the park has been like heaven on earth because um, while the mayor closed the parks and nobody quite knew what that meant, the federal parks stayed open. And although initially there was some concern and there was a period when the National Guard was there, eventually the National Guard left and the community figured out with help from the Park Service and Parks and People how to be safe in the park and have community, have sanity, have nature. And it truly has been an amazing thing to see Kind of the dreams that we've always had of what the park could mean for everybody in some ways coming true um, during this very difficult and tender time. Um, there's so many different things we can talk about here. One of the things I want to note is that um, we've tried to lift up kind of the non-white cultural heritage of green space because there's often an assumption when you talk about the environment that that's a white thing. And so as a white male of privilege, um, I think it's really important that I think about that. This is our park for all people map that we made with the park service and other partners of the park. And it really tries to look at just some of the touchstones of non-white cultural heritage on the hilltop and stretching down into Rock Creek to really inspire people about um, the African-American burial ground that's just five blocks away of 8,428 freed African-Americans who were lucky enough to get burial plots during reconstruction beginning in 1868. We know where they lived, we know how they died. Uh, we know a little bit then about how they lived. It wasn't easy. They were free in name, but not really free. And so now we have a, we do, we do an annual commemoration of them called Lights of Freedom, where we light thousands of luminaria on their, in their honor on DC Emancipation Day. These are just some of the kinds of things that we can do, um, and we can do so much more. The park is tiny, really, when you think about it. It's only 12 acres. Central Park is 840. Rock Creek is over 1,000. Um, Rock Creek is the 15th biggest urban park in America. But this tiny little park has an awful lot going on in it. And, um, it really is a, an amazing place to kind of come together and explore um, how we can treat each other better and how we can treat the, the earth better. Um, and so in that interest, um, Parks and People is still here. This was Josephine's dream that it wouldn't just be about this one hill, it would be about helping people all over the city, really, because this is a city in a park. We're the greenest major city in North America with the highest percentage of public green acreage. And yet we don't really invest in that space the way we need to. The park service and the city's park agencies are grossly underfunded. Um, 
but we know what happens when we do invest in those things. And so today we have this Josephine Butler Park Center where I'm sitting named after Joe in one of those Mary Henderson buildings, one that she actually willed to her Japanese lover and he wasn't allowed to receive it because um, he, he was Japanese and a foreign national could not receive property. Um, but her husband had introduced Amendment 13 to the Constitution, who was one of the lead co-sponsors. Um, and um, this building is today now a little bit of a symbol of what the community greening movement can be. And our dream is it was the embassy of Hungary and Brazil and India had it and China wanted it, or no, the other way around, China had it, but India wanted it. Our dream is for this to be the embassy of the earth, not like the UN, but an embassy of this earth right here where we can lift up all that we have to learn from each other and from the land. Um, and sometimes on a quiet morning, you can listen and you feel like you can almost hear the voices of those native people who were here perhaps as long ago as a thousand generations and who's in many ways are still here. Uh, this is still their home and we still have so much to learn from them. Thank you. Great, thank you so very much, Steve. Um, so we're gonna you know, start a bit of a, a Q&A session. Um, we're a little late, so um, there are other aspects to the history of Meridian Hill Park that we have not yet um, touched on. Um, of course, one being uh, the, the history of protest and demonst demonstration and activism. Um, there is a, a significant history uh, related to that context uh, that's tied to the park. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke at the park on a number of occasions. Angela Davis spoke there. Um, it was the site of numerous different African-American and Black um, uh, activism groups. So the details of the, of the study, um, all of that is in there. So again, we'll share that link to the report if you would like to download that and read through that history. What I'd like to do now is just open up the uh, panel for discussion. And I have a few questions to ask the group. Um, feel free to talk amongst yourselves. Um, and whoever wants to answer the question, they're more than welcome to. Um, so the first question that we have is about uh, Mrs. Henderson um, and whether Mrs. Henderson, uh, is she, did she exclude or did she try to encourage churches to be built along 16th Street? Um, do we know anything about Mary Foote Henderson's attitude toward churches? And did that fit into her vision? That was not something I came across. It seems like it was primarily embassies and um, residences for wealthier people. Okay. All right. So uh, next question we have is, uh, it's actually a follow-up. Um, are churches part of the community now? Um, and if so, how? I can speak to that. Um, they have been. Um, you know, the, the hilltop has been a place of diversity and of unity. Um, the Catholic church that's at the base of the park, St. Augustine, used to be called St. Paul's. And back when it was St. Paul's, it was all white. But it integrated and it became St. Augustine and became, became the most integrated Catholic congregation in the city. Uh, and if you go there today, on a, um, the 1230 mass is almost like a gospel revival. But more importantly, in terms of the park, St. Augustine and Augustana Lutheran have partnered for generations now in leading stations of the cross through the park and the neighborhood. And they did this back in a time when a lot of people had given up on this part of town. And I, it was a really powerful thing to be uh, singing and praying and, and kind of comparing the stages of Christ's life with um, some of the struggles of this neighborhood. But I still remember the year when we were singing the refrain of we shall overcome that says we are not afraid. And I realized that we weren't anymore and kind of tears came down my face. But All Souls Unitarian uh, is a real beacon of light on the hill. And they used to host, actually, Joe Butler and I, every year we would do a sermon together in the park. And people joked that Joe Butler and I could relate the park to anything else on earth. <laughs> and actually, we, found, we were founded in the King Emmanuel Baptist Church, which is just two blocks um, 
down Calorama from the park. So, thank and you. There are still uh, embassies and churches as far down as uh, Military Road and even more if you can continue up to Eastern Avenue before you cross into Maryland. So, you know, I grew up just off of 16th Street on Montague Street. There were embassies all around there. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question we have uh, regards activism. Um, how has the park been used recently as a site of activism? Uh, council member, can you speak to any events that have taken place recently in the area? I feel like there's always something going on and it's not always stuff that I'm attuned to. Like, it's just always been a gathering place. I think I mentioned when I was talking earlier, like the reason I visited on my field trip was because it's been a place for activism and protest and gathering. I know, you know, there were a lot of people that gathered there um, after George Floyd was murdered. Um, and even now, I mean, even some of the performance that we see there is a form of expression of activism, like the Go Go Festival, for example, which, you know, in its art form um, is an expression of activism. I think the way that I see it now is, you know, there's always people who want to like march on the White House or the Capitol or be down at the National Mall. But I always think of Meridian Hill as the place that people gather when they're not necessarily trying to be like in the center of the spotlight, but really trying to be together in community in their form of protest. Um, so it creates a sort of just different feeling. I mean, also, so many of the activities there that take place that have taken place for a long time, their very existence is also like, this is sort of meta, I apologize, but their very existence is sort of a, a form of protest against, you know, outside forces and change as well. So I think of the drum circle. I know it's not really protest, but it is sort of a form of activism, right? Like this is a space that's owned by a, a group of people who are saying, you, know, you can be here with us, but this is our sacred space and we're not gonna allow a changing neighborhood or you know, people who wanna push us out to do that. We occupy this space, we occupy it for love and for music um, and for spiritual means, um, but it's also a form of activism. So I, I just feel like that's the flavor of activism. And sometimes you do have just like a regular protest too, but it's just a different, um, largely a sort of a different feel and a different motivation. Yeah, Brianne, you mentioned the GoGo -Go Festival. That was the thing we worked on with Long Live GoGo -Go DC and Capital Bop. And uh, it was truly the best program we've ever presented in the park. Julia was out there, the superintendent. Um, there were land acknowledgments done to the First Nations people before every act. Um, and it truly was an act of, of advocacy for um, all the ways that the land can bring us together. Um, and it was a tribute to what we called indigenous Black DC music. So it was go-go jazz, funk, um, and, and some hip hop, uh, and just such a blend of people and ethnicity and everything. In the George Floyd uh, protests, uh, we actually rang the Josephine Butler Justice Bell, which has a whole story that has been used in the park for uh, back to when Joe pulled it out to honor um, the story about how Queen Julianne uh, came from the Netherlands um, when the Carillon was temporarily stationed in the park and she came to ring the smallest bell. Um, and she said, we must always listen to the smallest bells for they are symbols of justice. And Joe loved that. So we've been ringing her tiny little bell ever since. Wonderful, excellent. So um, we are getting close to the end of our time, um, but I did have a uh, you know, quick question for both the council member and for Steve. Um, you know, we've been talking recently just about activism and outreach. So if people feel inspired by today's conversation, if people want to uh, participate um, what are some avenues for them to either volunteer or get involved in activism? Um, any recommendations or guidance that you could provide? Sure. Um, so uh, Parks and People is citywide. Um, we've helped 200 communities uh, transform 230 
parks, playgrounds, community gardens all over town. Um, you can contact us at uh, volunteer at washingtonparks.net. We've been partnering with the Park Service for 32 years at Meridian Hill Malcolm X. Actually won the highest organizational honor in the national park system from President Clinton and the Park Service. Um, but really you don't have to you know, join something else. You can start it on your own. Um, it's as simple as recognizing that public land belongs to all of us and we all have to treat it as owners. We all have a mutual responsibility to speak up for it, to make it come alive, to um, really realize the full intent of the park service that's so beautifully stated in the education, inspiration, and enjoyment for this and future generations. Uh, we do cleanups in the park every month, but it's an ongoing thing. Our parks need all the love and all the help they can get. And we need more voices um, speaking up to the council as well. Um, you know, council member Nadeau has been a believer in this from the beginning, but we're not funding uh, the, the city parks uh, operations the way we need to. Um, and during the pandemic, that's been a real challenge. I'll just say, I normally refer people to parks and people. <laughs> um, but also that the, um, there's a great need for, um, you know, folks to just be picking up litter and, you know, keeping an eye on the shrubbery. And we used to, when I was at ANC, we used to do like cleanup days and, um, we learned from Don Kirk, you know, how to take care of all of the plants. And actually, I started a I started a graffiti removal squad. We got everybody trained with all the right things to get it off the special historic surfaces, which is long since disbanded. I mean, we're talking decades ago, but um, it it's it's sort of a my Girl Scout mentality of look for work and leave things better than they found them. And anybody can do that, like Steve was saying. Um, the other thing is just about what I was talking about earlier, where we're all educating newcomers all the time about how wonderful our community is in this space in particular. And I've definitely um, heard of, of stories where you have somebody newer who um, just doesn't understand the spirit of things and tries to tell a person, oh, well, you can't do this or you can't do that because it makes them uncomfortable. And other people who are frequent users of the park will step in and say, this is a space for all of us. You know, we all are here in harmony. And I think it's really important that we constantly um, are deliberate about that in our communal spaces, especially spaces as sacred as this park. So um, this is just a little, it's a, it's a, it's a, a little plug for, um, for how we make community in that space. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so we are unfortunately running out of time. Um, there is still so much that we could discuss. Um, the, the special resource study that was put together is quite extensive. Um, so again, you know, I highly encourage everyone to check that out. Um, but I will say now that, you know, thank you so much to our panelists, um, council member Nadeau, Elise, Steve, uh, Burnell and Carol. Um, we really do appreciate your time this evening and, uh, for all of your insights and great memories, uh, about Meridian Hill Park, Malcolm X Park. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it now over to Jeannie Braha and she will conclude our, uh, our webinar. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, thank you, Brad, for moderating. Thanks to all who helped make this program possible. And of course, thanks to all of you. I regret we weren't able to get to all of the, the questions as well. I can tell you that um, there were a few comments that came in right at the end. It's clear that both Meridian Hill is an incredibly special place. Um, people sharing some specific memories that we'll be sure to document and share with the park and others so we can keep track of that. Um, I'll note since there were a few questions to this effect, just a reminder that tomorrow, I'll say tomorrow afternoon and maybe we'll surprise you, but tomorrow morning we will share via email from Rock Creek Conservancy a recording of this program as well as a link to the special resource study um, and any other resources that were shared. Um, I think that this program really spotlighted something that we talk about a lot here at the Conservancy and, and our role is really as a philanthropic and stewardship partner of the entirety of the park. So that's the that main body of Rock Creek Park between 16th and Connecticut Avenue, but also the 99 circles, squares, sports, traffic triangles and really special places like Meridian Hill Park that you heard about tonight. Um, 
we talk a lot about Rock Creek as being a place where people can come together and express their shared values. And I think the diversity of panelists that we heard from today, but that enduring theme throughout really uh, echoes that and resonates that. And I apologize, there's vacuuming in the background here. Um, and we also firmly believe here at the Conservancy that we will need systems change to make our world and our parks more equitable. And that might mean park service policies, that might mean district policies. Um, so we're glad that Julia and uh, Council Member Nadu are both here. Um, but it also means, as the council member shared so eloquently, it also means the choices we each make when we enter these spaces so that we're sure we're making them as welcoming and inviting to each other as we can. And to echo Steve's comments that he invited all of you to come and volunteer, I think to honor Martin Luther King during this weekend of service coming up, I invite you all to go to the Conservancy's website and we'll be sure to share links tomorrow in that email. Um, under the volunteer tab, we have a link to our Ma Martin Luther King page, which has, I believe, almost 20 events that you can choose from Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. To give back a little bit to the gift that is Rock Creek, we invite you to join us in removing invasive plants, picking up litter. I think we might have the Washington Parks and People, a few of those events at Meridian Hill or other places in the park in there as well. Um, and then I also invite you to join us throughout the year for the rest of this, not the rest of this, but just the ongoingness <laughs> of this Race History and Rock Creek program series. We have just scratched the surface of this particular topic and there are so many more topics to share. Next month's program will be on February 24th. It will be a um, special exploration. Um, we'll be joined by our partners at Montgomery History who have done extensive research around the racially motivated lynchings of African Americans that took place in Rockville, Maryland in the late 1800s, as well as an expert on the topic of biophobia, which is that um, generationally inherited trauma that informs some experiences of the outdoors as well as by a fantastic um, leader of today who is helping to address that issue of biophobia by connecting community members with parks in a special way. Um, these topics are complicated and deep and there's no way we can address them fully in 90 minutes, but we will do our best. And to that end, we invite you to join the discussion as well as to continue this discussion on your own, on the trails, perhaps at a drum circle in Meridian Hill over the next um, coming weeks. And um, thank you all so very much and have a wonderful evening. Stay warm and stay safe.